Last week, I had the honor to spend close to a week in Israel, the Holy Land, together with uh, the new Argentinian president, Javier Millet. At his invitation, he invited me to come along with him. And we spent time, a different, uh, very moving experience at the Western Wall, at Yad Vashem. He was at the kibbutz in, um, down south where the atrocities took place, kibbutz Berry, as well as other visits that he had over the few days that he was in Israel. From there he went off to Rome on Friday, last Friday, a week ago Friday. Now you may wonder, what connection do I have to the president? I would say it's a heavenly connection. A few months ago, just a few months ago, in September is when I first met him. I gave him a copy of my book, Toward a Meaningful Life in Spanish. And ever since, we've bonded in ways that I can't fully explain, but there's some very deep soul connection there. People ask me what type of person he is. A deeply spiritual person, very sincere, excellent instincts, a highly intelligent person. He's not what some people think, some type of reckless, uh, wild guy. And he's just a very unique, uh, powerful individual in a position of a head of state. As he told me, why is he going to Israel? He wants to hug the wall. He wants to hug the kota. So I'm not going to go into the whole details of my relationship with him, but the big headlines in the last few days have been that since he went to Israel, where he prayed at the wall, and there are pictures of it and videos of him dancing and so on, a day later, two Argentinian hostages, Israeli Argentinian hostages, were freed in Rafa, in South Gaza. Now, maybe many of you may not know this, but a few hours before that, on Thursday, the president, Millet, visited in Herzliya, the Argentinian embassy, he visited with the families of these hostages. There were 13 Argentinians that were taken hostage on October 7th. Two were released in the exchange a few months ago, and two were free just this past week, literally a day after he met with his families and a day after he was at the wall. So everyone's thinking, what, you know, what's the secret here? Are our prayers answered? What does President Millet know that many of us don't know? And you can't ignore the, the juxtaposition here of events. And um, so I want to talk about this. You know, amidst all the pain and loss and plenty of it on all sides, it's important to also recognize that in times like this is where we really have to develop our crystal clear picture, moral compass, and moral vision, which is what President Millet has. I can't tell you where it comes from. He just has deep instinct of what is right and what is wrong. This is not just a pro-Jewish or pro-Israeli political stance. It's just what is right and what is wrong. And he connects to it. And he's unabashed about it and unapologetic. Tremendous lessons you can learn from it. When we were at Yad Vashem, Yad Vashem is like a Holocaust museum essentially in Israel. Jerusalem. Um, it was like an hour tour where um, he was shown, and I was right there with, with him, the pictures, the videos, the history of what happened in the Holocaust. One hour, and there were media there. The man, President Millet, did not say one word, just absorbed it all. Usually people say, remark, you know, how terrible, we won't let it happen again, things like that. And um, I saw the humility and uh, of his being able to just take it all in. Afterwards, he gave a talk. In the talk, he quoted a Talmud. He said, I'm going to share a Talmudic story of Rabbi Akiva, a great sage, close to 2,000 years ago, who with his colleagues was looking at the Temple Mount after the destruction of the Second Temple. And his colleagues were crying when they saw the fox coming out of the place that was once the Holy of Holies. They saw it became a desolate wilderness. So they were crying for what it was and what it, what it had become. And Rabbi Akiva was smiling, was laughing. Now why they were crying was obvious. When you saw, they saw the fulfillment of the tragic prophecies. But why are you smiling? Why are you so happy? Rabbi Akiva said, because I also see the second half of the prophecy. 
that after the destruction will come something greater, will be rebuilt. He says, we were just in Yad Vashem, we saw destruction. Horrible. It's destruction. Over six million Jews and everything else that came with it. And now we walk outside and we look at a Jerusalem that's being rebuilt and will continue to be rebuilt. And we see both visions. This is what a president of a country is saying. I have to tell you, not only is it refreshing, it's revolutionary. How many leaders are speaking this way? You know, we have leaders today. Maybe they're administrators, maybe they're fundraisers, maybe they're good panderers, maybe they're good uh, politicians and uh, well, not a maneuver. But ideas, a vision, a time like this. I mean, where's that Churchillian speech that someone rises and says, we are all one mankind, the human race, let us come together, as diverse and as, di- and as different as we may be. And I see in a, pers- a man like him, I don't see that, that, that jaded pol- pol- politics. And I am sure he's far from perfect. I am sure you could find skeletons, I am sure. But his, pres- his approach to life is so refreshing. And as a head of a state, head of state and a leader, I saw that to be the greatest miracle of all. So it's not surprising to me that a day after he's standing at the wall, Argentinians are freed. We need to have clarity, vision. We need to be committed to it and not be ambiguous. When you start comparing it to some of the presidents of the universities when they were asked, is it all right to rape a child? The atrocities that we saw on October 7th, and when they answer, it depends on context. On context. So in other words, everything is context. That called being more morally blurred, if not corrupt entirely. So yes, there is a miracle happening in our times, and we can all be part of that miracle. Miracles don't just mean supernatural events out there. It means that in a time when many people are confused, and there's plenty of ambiguity and moral, moral confusion in the media, a polarization. It's more important that I win and you lose as opposed to a common good, a common ground that we can all find. Even when we have differences of opinion that we can't, are unable to speak to each other, we need to cancel each other. We need to, you need to be wrong for me to be right. We are part of creating that miracle. So I look at President Millet, I look at President Javier Millet, and I see a person out of the blue, an underdog, no one would have expected, and has that type of clarity. At Davos, he gave a talk that has been lauded by, by cynics and critics and skeptics as being a person of, of ideas, finally ideas. And not just theoretical ideas. Man is a, the man is an economist. So there's a lot we can learn from him. I'm not here to push any individual. I'm here to push a vision. This is a time of vision, that we must have vision here. That's what happens in time of crisis. It forces us to dig deeper, not to get more confused, but to come out with, what do we stand for? What do we believe, what do we believe in? So here I was with a man walking the, this, the ancient streets of Jerusalem. You know the word Jerusalem means? complete reverence. That's what it means. It's made up of two words. Yira Shalem. Complete, wholesome, full reverence. Reverence. Reverence for something greater than myself and my needs and my interests. Now I'm sure President Millet has his battles that he has to fight with his parliament, with his senate. The country needs a lot of help. But I have no doubt that a vision the way he's carrying it and his look at things the look of Rabbi Akiva, to look at darkness but see that it's one step toward greater light will help him, will help his people, will help the entire world because that's what we need today. So there are miracles in our times despite the challenges. Now what is the soul like? People want to know what kind of soul a soul is? I'll tell you the truth. Souls are not defined as bodies are. You know, a body you can define by its weight, by its body language, by its looks. It can be quantified with our senses, with what we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. But you can't see or hear or taste, touch, and smell a soul. A soul is something sublime. It's actually where the word reverence is a perfect word for it. 
It's respecting something that's not quite under your control. It's not a commodity that you can acquire. It's not a product that you can buy and purchase. Each of us has a soul. A soul is our inner identity. I like to look at it that it's God's musical note that he invested in you. That you are a piece of music and you have a song to sing, and many songs to sing, that are unique to you. And when you sing that song, that's your soul expressing itself. When you're busy following my, my, your own needs and your own existential and survival needs, then you're busy following your body, you're following your, the here and now. Your soul provides vision, your soul provides purpose and meaning. So here's a man that has a soul, and he's connected to it. I haven't analyzed it, I haven't explored it, I haven't interviewed him on it, but I just see something shines through. Is it coming from his parents? Is it coming from his environment, from his experiences? But again, it's not about the person, it's what he represents. I really believe, I think, that all of us should look at an example and how to apply that to our own lives. There are more hostages. There's blood being shed. There are innocent people dying. We can all start getting into each one of us into our corners and our positions. But it's time to maybe step back and just look at the reality for what it is. Eight billion people on this planet. We have very different opinions. We may have adamantly different, adamantly opposite opinions. But there's a way, there's a way. We had a man called Abraham. President Millet looks to Abraham. I don't mean Abraham Lincoln, Abraham of the Bible. The patriarch, Abraham. As a man that established a moral vision. A father of all nations. Had a son who would become the ancestor, Yishmael, of the Arab, later Muslim world. Had another son that would become the ancestor of the Jewish world. And Israel. He had a grandson. His son had also two sons. One who would become the ancestor of the Western Roman Christian world. And another son who would continue the path of the Jewish tradition. So they all began in that tent, in Abraham's tent. Where? In what would become later Israel, the land of Israel. So we're going back thousands of years. That's where President Millet looks for direction from a man called Abraham. That's where we should be looking for direction. All of us, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, atheists, agnostics, everything over and in between. Because we do share one larger destiny called the human race. And we all want to have happiness for our families. And we want to find love in our lives. And we want to eliminate the toxins, including toxins of hatred. How it got to this point, who knows? I did a video a few months ago to my dear Muslim cousins and friends. What would Abraham, your grandfather, say? You know, I look at the events going on now, the distortions, the ulterior, the alternative narratives. You'd think different worlds what we live in. Now, I acknowledge I'm Jewish, so it's not surprising where my position may be. But I really try, honestly try to be as open-minded as I can. And for the life of me, I cannot understand the conversation going on. I'd like anyone to give me a response to what I'm going to say right now. Even someone who will offer hate mail in history, all of history. I'm not just talking about Israel or Jewish history. In all of history of war, how do wars end? How do they end? So they either end by one side completely vanquishing and destroying the other side, including all the, all the collateral damage, including civilians unfortunately being killed, or it ends by... One side surrendering, what's called unconditional surrender. Ultimately, Japan did that, and Germany did that, and ultimately Japan did that. Unconditional surrender. And the victor dictates the terms. You want to end this battle? You want to end the humanitarian crisis? Why are there all the distortions? Very simple. Go back to where it began. The Hamas surrenders absolutely. Yes, surrenders returns all the hostages that they took, which was, obviously, we all agree, absolutely unacceptable as a mild word, revoke all their calls of the annihilation from land to sea of Israel and the Jewish people, and then prove it in actions, 
You have an end to the war immediately. You have an end to the humanitarian crisis. Let the Gaza civilians go back to regular life. Why is no one calling for that? Instead, all kinds of distortions. Let's do some tra hostage trade-offs, humanitarian crisis, create corridors. We're all for protecting civilians. This is called moral clarity. Now I know the argument against it will be this war didn't begin October 7th. It's a war going on for years. Israel has been the oppressor for so many years. But we're talking right now, this battle right now. You want to address that? Address it. There are ways to address it. It's not through uh, raping dead women and little children and mutilating and burning them alive. So meeting President Millet has just fortified my own clarity. And I see a man goes to the wall, unabashed. He's not Jewish. But he senses a sense of history, a vision. He senses that there is a higher conscience. And we will, call the, we, will, we will be called upon. Together, let us create a vision for the future. That's what we should be joining hands together. Everyone. I will talk more about the connections I may have. No, not everything is here for public broadcasting. But I will say this, that when leaders and leaders are chosen by a higher invisible hand, we don't know all the mysteries. The true leaders have to rise to the occasion. And maybe here we have a president who will, in a motivational way, an inspiring way, call upon the world leaders and all of us to, to together unite in this common vision and destiny of our world because this is a historic wake-up call and historic time and just as a miracle happened a small miracle we need many more much larger ones can happen when we are sincere when we're pure and we pray and we ask for the right things it definitely can spill over and affect the entire situation and crisis in that part of the world and all over the world and we, we all learn how to connect to our own souls and connect in ways that both transform our personal lives, our collective lives, and ultimately the globe itself, and experience personal and global redemption. That's my prayer, my wish, my hope, and I'm fully confident that Rabbi Akiva and his vision, and when you stand in Jerusalem at certain places, this may be exactly where we see what he saw, sees through the haze, sees through the smokes, sees through the clouds and smoke screens and sees the bigger vision that is emerging and it brings a smile to all of us as the t end of that statement in the Talmud that his colleagues, when they heard him say that, they said, Akiva, you've comforted us. Akiva, you've comforted us. Let us all be comforted knowing that bigger vision is emerging. That bigger vision is emerging from all that is happening right now Everything that has happened in history is happening for this time. So when we look back, we could say we were part, not bystanders, spectators, we were part of making it happen. Part of the unfolding drama of a new world, of a new reality, and a new picture for all of us and our families, a world of peace and harmony within diversity. Thank you so much. This has been Simon Jacobson. And... Fascinating as well, I should add, that a place called Argentina that not long ago harbored Nazi war criminals, including Eichmann and others, has now a president that's coming to the wall and embracing everything that the Jewish people, and I say the Jewish people, I mean it in a universal way, a universal way, thousands of years of bringing this moral vision to the world. That is another part of this miracle. So thank you again. This has been Simon Jacobson. MeaningfulLife.com is our website. Please check us out. We have a wide array of materials that you can take advantage of. Please subscribe to our growing YouTube channel. Subscribe to our weekly emails. Share. And I'd love to hear your thoughts, feedback, comments of all sorts. Be well and be blessed.